Hey, I'm Andrew Hales. Welcome to another edition of Chatting With. I'm here with Philip. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's an honor. You're an ex-meth head? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was addicted to meth for a year, but really I suffer from what's polysubstance chemical dependency, meaning I can get addicted to pretty much anything. Uh, and so I've tried pretty much almost every drug out there. And uh, when I tried meth, uh, it just skyrocketed and became my drug of choice almost instantly. You're 28? Yes. When did you try meth for the first time? Uh, first time I tried meth, I was 20 years old. A friend had it. Uh, it was one of those things, like, I used to look down on people just for trying MDMA, <laughs> ecstasy, or, or any of those things, or even pharmaceuticals. And I hate to say it's a gateway effect, because I, I feel like it's so cliche, but, you know, it did really start with pot, and then it was kind of like stick to all natural, so I got into like the shrooms and things like that. It all comes from the earth, and then drinking, socially accepted, pharmaceuticals came next. And then one day uh, my ex bought ecstasy and I was really hesitant to even try it. And then when I tried it, it kind of opened up my mind to this world of, of illicit drugs that I didn't know existed. And uh, I, I thought I could handle meth because I tried heroin, I've tried everything else up to that point. I, I didn't really get addicted, like I could dabble. And uh, I was always dabbling in different things, but when I tried meth, it was like all bets are off. So I kind of made it my life mission at some point to try every drug that was out there. Have you tried every drug? Uh, almost everyone. Uh, there's a couple. <laughs> LSD in particular is one that I never messed with. How did you eventually get sober? What was the moment of clarity? For me, it was, um, I always tell people this, my last day of using was like any other day of using. It was just so weird uh, to me. Uh, and I just, I felt, the next day I felt empty. And it wasn't like I was, I could cry. It wasn't like being sad. And uh, it was just like being nothing. And there was just nothing but kind of like shame for what I'd done. And uh, but there wasn't much emotional drive. And I was with my mother and we were out eating and I was actually just talking to her about it. And she gave me kind of like that crossroads where, hey, I could take you to detox or I could have went home and got high. And I just said, you know what? Like I'm done and that's it. So that was three years after you started meth, but then so you relapsed a few times. Yes. Okay, how long were you in rehab in 2013? 2013, I was just in uh, rehab for 30 days, and I kind of just put my life in other people's hands because I tried to get sober for a while before that, mainly to get my ex back, and nothing worked. Mm. I invented all these programs for myself, like just go to the gym, just go to school, just do the next right thing, but I was miserable. And uh, I just decided I'm going to just put my life in other people's hands, and I didn't want to do it. Like my mind was, everything in my mind was saying no, but I just walked through it anyways. And uh, so when I went to detox, they were saying, go to 30 day rehab. I didn't want to, I was arguing in my head, but I just said, okay. And then they said, go into sober living, which is kind of like a halfway house, mm. arguing with it again in my head. My head makes the worst decisions. Like my best decisions got me to where I was. Mm. And I was like, I'm just gonna trust these are professionals with my best interests in mind. So I just went to sober living and just kind of did what everybody suggested. How close is Adderall to meth to you? Pepsi versus Coca-Cola. No. Yeah. But I would say, you know, it's dependent on <laughs> genetics. So I'm like a meth head. No, because the only difference is I would say our route of administration and that increases bioavailability and also the fact that meth is a lot cheaper. Every time you hit that bowl, it's just like a big rush of Adderall and then you say, well, I want another rush. And then you hit the bowl again, another rush. And you get to the point to where you're so iced out that if you take another hit, you're, you think you're going to die but you feel amazing at the same time, like you're floating. So it's like, but as far as the lower doses, if we were to, if I were to put the same dose of Adderall in my body and the same dose of meth and uh, be at the peak of both of them, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I would say uh, meth has, it didn't have as bad of a come down for me and it had less body load were the main differences. So it wasn't as hard on the body when I was in the experience. To where taking 10 Adderall pills, I was like, oh man, this body load and this come down. Yeah. Wait, body load? Yeah. It's just like stress to the body where you're kind of like tensing your body or whatever. And this mm -hmm. happens at high doses, not so much the low doses. Uh -huh. And the next day, usually you feel it more so than when you're on it. Smoking it like once is the same as taking like... 40 milligrams of Adderall? Yeah, somewhere between 20 to 40. It depends on how good the person is at actually vaping it properly. Okay. So what are some steps you've been taking for to, I guess, repair your brain tissue and 
your neurotransmitters and homeostasis and tolerance and everything? You know, I'd like to say, you know, the truth is when I got into drugs, like it was to me, like I had no friends. The first time I smoked weed, I didn't necessarily like it. So there was like all these underlying issues. Like yeah. I was bullied in middle school. I was socially anx anxious. Like I didn't have any friends and my parents were going through a rough divorce and all that was very hard on me as a kid. And, and I just saw pot as a way to fit in. So when I got sober, it was like just taking the drugs out of the equation wasn't enough because I was this, the same discontent, socially anxious, irritable, restless Philip that I was when I was using the drugs. So that's what I was using to solve. And I take the solution away, so now I have to find a new solution. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just like, I'm gonna be miserable. I'm one of those people that I can't just sit there and just be stagnant. I always have to be progressing towards something. To this day, you're still like that? Yes, and it's constant, and honestly, I'm an infant in recovery, mm. even though I have five years of sobriety. It's just like, I'm very, the recovery thing is such a process, and it's, it's really enlarging my spiritual life, and I know spirituality is one of those taboo subjects, but to me, spirituality is, is prioritizing the human spirit and soul over materialistic or physical things. That's the definition of it, mm. and uh, the human spirit can be seen from tons of different conceptions, and I respect all of them. You know, for me, it can be seen as like just an emotional well-being. That's focusing on being content with what I have rather than thinking that getting a million dollars is what's gonna make me content and driving towards that. Instead, mm -hmm. just saying, I'm content with what I have, so I'm clear-headed enough to pursue things in appropriate ways. Nice, uh, so you've been meditating? Yeah. Every day? No, that's more of a here and there thing. A lot of what helps me is support groups in okay. general and having guidance from people that have long-term sobriety do you feel like it's caused uh, permanent brain damage that's a question i'm asked pretty often as well and uh there's really no way to know and uh, because i don't know i can't like really see where i'm at at this stage in my uh, development because my frontal cortex didn't develop till i was 25 fully you know i'm content i'm happy uh -huh. um i'm effective at work uh, but at the same time i do notice little things like bouncing my leg all the time or like getting uh, waves of anxiety that are completely unrealistic and yeah. can almost seem crazy. Uh, but at the same time, for the most part, I'm able to feel at peace, sleep at night, and focus on things. Yeah, you seem like you're doing totally fine. Yeah. Like you came out totally alive. I get that a lot too, and I think, uh, <laughs> you know, drugs, uh, we get an idea of a meth head, you think of the guy with no teeth, mm -hmm. with scabs and all that, and it's not always the case. You know, yeah. I've, I've met people that look just perfectly normal. I mean, you have doctors, lawyers that are using addicted to meth. You know, it doesn't discriminate. You have poverty addicted to meth. You have everything. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it, you mentioned a video banging it or slamming. shooting it up, mm -hmm. slamming it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you could slam meth. <laughs> that's um, what they call it. <laughs> it's like yeah. that's the best way to do it. It's the most dangerous way to do it. <laughs> that's for sure. The first time I slammed meth, I came in my pants. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's such a cross addiction with sex. Meth and sex go together, and without the sex, I wouldn't have liked meth. Okay. Uh, like without your girlfriend. It was, never well, with, it was never like orgies and sex clubs or anything? It was. I mean, it got to that point, because it's progressive. If I had told you what meth is like, at the core of it. Yeah. Like, it starts off as a lie that says you're more effective at work, you're... you're doing better then it gets into porn and you're watching it obsessively then you abuse your arousal system to now where you're going out and finding whatever you can find and getting involved in these sex parties and then uh, that becomes not enough and then you start to get into like really sick stuff like violence yeah and that's what's so scary about meth i would say it's like uh standing at the edge of the cliff and almost meth is like this voice that's just saying to you like jump and huh. just do it and like let the darkness just fill you as you you know plummet to your death like meth stimulates evilness like i don't know how else to describe it it yeah. stimulates it to such an extreme that you get to where you don't care about anything like you get to a point where you're psychopathic completely and you almost look forward to the darkness like you're you're welcoming it and it becomes like this oh it's just such a gnarly world man like i really can't describe how dark meth made me and how much it messed up my mind but it's like the opposite of spirituality yeah absolutely a hundred percent wow just totally evil and you get off on it normally you wouldn't you'd say why am i doing this like mm -hmm. normally 
But on meth, you're like, let's do something really sick and twisted and get fucked up. And you're just tweaked out of your skull and you haven't slept in like five days. So you're not really in touch with reality. Yeah. And you're going out and doing these fucked up things. You know, you go to these parties. Like, I would go to them to have sex and, and smoke meth. And there was one time where I left and I was like, I didn't have sex with anybody. I was just shooting meth the whole time. And the, it just becomes more about the drug at some point. And that's when things get even more dark. And yeah. you start to get to where sex isn't doing for it for you anymore. It's not twisted enough. So then for me, it's like getting aroused by ideas of violence. And it would actually arouse me and get me excited. As yeah. crazy as that sounds. And no. I'm a chill dude. Like, that makes I've perfect ne- sense. I have yeah. no... I've never gotten a ticket in my life. I've never been to jail in my life. Like, okay. naturally, I'm not a person that is violent. Or I'm not a person... And I'm very... Uh, I'm, I'm not naturally not that promiscuous. Like, I like to fuck, don't get me wrong. But I'm naturally not, like, throwing my body out like it's a... Yeah. Like a piece of crap. And, and <laughs> meth just took all self-preservation, all self-love, all, all those soul. things... Yeah, it Takes took all soul. of it and it threw it out the window. Yeah. And it was completely eradicated. And you're just a carnal animal. It's really what it's like at yeah. the peak of it. And then, uh, you know, that's especially at the binges. Then you start getting psychotic and having hallucinations. So it's like you haven't slept in seven days. There would be times where it's like, I, I think the mafia put a hit out on me. One time I thought aliens were coming. And uh, I was so sure yeah. of it, and I could see him in the sky coming down on meth, that yeah. I, I got out basically a phone book, and I don't know how I found one, and I started calling every number in the book. And it's, it was like a 48-hour process of calling these numbers. So I was so convinced. And then there was like times where I'd be searching for meth on the ground for like days, like th- 72 hours, just like specs. And I'm loading the bowl, and I'm forgetting what I'm doing. So I think that I remember thinking that I was loading a plasma gun that was going to take over the world with these crystal shards that I was finding on the ground. Uh-huh. And then at the end, I would smoke it, and then it would end up being just dirt. You know what I mean? Because I was hallucinating. Meth was pretty self-defeating in that sense, because it was just like I struggle with meth to this day, like to an extent. It's almost like being a diabetic. But the thing is, and I know it's continual treatment, continual recognition, not being overconfident. But what makes what's scary about meth addiction is I know there's a chance I'm going to relapse in my life. And you know, with things like diabetes, it affects the person, but it doesn't it hurt people around them. Like doing these things, like destroyed my family, destroyed so many people around me. It put me at so much danger and put other people at danger. And uh, there's a chance I'm going to relapse and I have to live with that because when I think about meth, like if meth was in this room and you walked out for whatever reason and I was in here for an hour, I would go. Like there's, it's one of those things where you just don't, you aren't around it. Like recovering alcoholics can go to a bar, you know, after they've been sober a year or two. Uh, Here I am, I haven't done meth since 2011 and uh, I can't be around it, period. It triggers off something in my brain. And I get to where I want that darkness back. And I want not necessarily the darkness, but I know the highs and I know the sex parties and the culture environment and the filth. And I'm aroused by it to this day. But it's not something that I entertain. You know, I just see it as a bad idea. It's like I could see meth and, yeah, it lights me up. It's like seeing a really hot girl but knowing she has AIDS. Like, yeah, she's, you know, I'm lit up by that. But at the same time, that's a horrible idea because it's not worth losing the life that I've built up yeah. by working spiritual principles and having a support group. That's crazy. Um, I'm giving you a lot. I feel like I'm giving you a lot to edit. <laughs> no, this is like, that's the thing about your, your channel. Like you, you go on these rants, but it, it's all interesting and it's all in one take and it's, it's, yeah, I never it's, it's great. Yeah, it's great. Like you do a really good job at um, monologues, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you practice or what, but yeah. No, never. It's always just throw on the. I tell people making my videos is so easy. It literally takes me like twelve minutes. Yeah. Because it's throw on the camera, throw it on Final Cut, touch it up a bit, done. Yeah. But That's, it's just about knowing that what I'm talking about is the truth. So you know the scene where Jesse's like, "Hold on," and he digs the hole, and the guy comes out, and he's like, "What are you digging? Why did he do that? Why was it fascinating to the meth head for him to get into the house?" Well, it's just like um, paranoia. Yeah. Like if I saw someone out front digging and I was out of my mind, I would be very interested in what he's doing and probably believe everything that he told me. Yeah. If he told me he was digging to China, I would have believed him because I was completely out of my mind. Yeah. Uh, I do think that that scene in particular 
kind of showed the meth head as like this guy with rotted out teeth and all that but yeah. So it was like stigmatizing it, but I got what Jesse was doing. I got what I was trying to do, and I'm like, in that situation, that would make sense to do. Does Breaking Bad depict meth heads correctly? No. Oh. No, not at all. Shit. It's it's on two different extremes to me. Um, like some people that smoke meth, like honestly, they function perfectly normal. And you would have no idea. They're even able to sleep and eat on it. And they're smoking meth all the time. And it all has to do with genetic predisposition. Like someone with ADD is going to react completely different. Okay. So I, I feel like it was just... Yeah, to, probably I, I figure someone with a lot of ADD is going to act more normal if they smoke meth. Yes. It's like Adderall. And that is the case. Damn. Some people can actually smoke meth and go to sleep. And I just felt like that show in particular, it kind of had extremes to an extent. Like... Here's yeah. the really messed up guy in the house, and here's this guy who's able to do it occasionally and get away with it. You know what I mean? And there was no middle ground or really depiction of the person who's functioning with it. Do you have a few book recommendations for recovery? I don't know. Uh, Man Search for Meaning, blah, blah, blah. No, I won't say you know whether or not I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I think Bill Wilson's book is probably the number one recommendation just because it's so interesting a guy who was an alcoholic and now this has diverse to narcotics and all these anonymous yeah. programs have adopted this program he created and i just think it's so interesting because you read a story and this is before the internet this was before drug rehabs this was before aa so there's this guy who can't stop drinking and he gets together with a bunch of other guys and um you know they find a way together and write a book on it and you read it and it's just so interesting to me. It's almost like a religious text, but at the same time, it doesn't force you to have a conception of God that's linear. It, it just it kind of does imply that you need a power greater than yourself, uh, and that could be anything. And usually, it's something that supersedes your will. And uh, for me, one time I was on my way to drink, and uh, what stopped me was I, I thought I could get away, get away with it, or kind of knew I could, but and I, I was going to lie to my family, my recovery program. And what stopped me was. I, you know, they won't know, but I will know. So the truth kind of was that higher power that superseded my will in that time. And I've seen people stop doing things they want to do because they love their daughter. And it's about fostering a conscious contact with that thing that makes you do the next right thing. And understanding it and nurturing that relationship with it, maybe even, and then taking a daily inventory for me of what I did throughout the day. You know, what are my motives self-seeking? Um, you know, was I resentful? Was I dishonest? Do I have amends I need to make? And not actually writing it down daily so I can build that connection stronger and stronger. Yeah. And that's what honestly keeps me sober. And it's a really trippy experience. You mentioned you, you've been helping out, helping out at um, homeless shelters or something, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Being charitable, um, do you think it's selfless or selfish because you're trying to boost your self-esteem or I think almost all acts of kindness at their core is selfish but I, don't, I think that's okay you yeah. know it's like this thing of uh, progression not perfection yeah and I get that you know but you know even me like I'm an actor trying to be a director like trying to direct the world and I my kind acts are so that you know everything will play out the way I want it to and wouldn't life be so beautiful if it played out according to Philip's willpower my willpower yeah and uh, you know I'm kind to people in a way to get what I want out of them and when I don't get what I want I'm an asshole and it's letting go of that like in dissolving self which takes time and I am by no means anywhere near like good at this yeah, but it's yeah. like just understanding it and seeing other people that are you know they show it through their actions and there's something about their energy and the way they carry themselves that you see it. Mm -hmm. It is exciting and it's something to look forward to. And it definitely takes meth out of the picture because those two things just cannot work together. Do you want to shout out anything? I created a nonprofit called I Am Shameless. And the reason that I created it was it was, take, it was taking CG Kid as a proof of concept and saying we need more addicts to share about their past experiences that are real. Because we already know heroin's bad. We already know meth is bad. It's like... You know, that's all you can find. Meth is bad. Meth is fucked up. Look how fucked up this guy is. And it's like a lot of these parents that have someone struggling that want to understand it better will go to these videos or even in universities have a lot of doctors donating, neurologists donating because they say it helps them understand the subjective experience better. Mm. And then I think it could even end up in the high schools at some point in a more real format of public speaking and Q&A and actually like because right now, like the D.A.R.E. program, man, I'm just like, this is... Yeah. CG Kid is just the proof that, like, an anti-drug channel can get 
84,000 subscribers to me that is unbelievable I would love to see dare try to pull that off but it's yeah. it's working and so with this nonprofit all I'm doing is getting donations that are tax deductible and then hiring people so I'll buy like a video from a guy in Cali or send him a camera and get videos from him and just start putting on the site promoting it and eventually like I'm just sharing this with yeah. you so you understand like no no that's so, cool. I'm, I'm by, so, so yeah so, and then you would put on CG kid no I put on the website I'm shameless.org okay. like it's his own media platform okay. and then right now what we're trying to do is get these rehabs on board and basically saying that will allow sponsorships that's how we're really trying to get our donations and that's that's been hell dude these rehab owners like between us it's like there's some of them are sicker than the people that go yeah they want to buy my phone number i, I got offered it's a business yeah yeah i got offered three hundred thousand dollars for my phone number and now uh, what they want to do is use it to manipulate people into thinking rehab's the only way out Whoa. and uh it would be me standing for hey you know i have this concept i have this application and i know seo i know how to market this this nonprofit is tax deductible like you could actually save money with this and they're like, we don't give a shit about concepts. We want to flip beds now. Like, what can you do for us now? They're so like, a lot of them are 60 year old men's these CEOs and they just, they don't have that broad vision. Intervention is, to me, it's a lot of Hollywood fluff and it gives this false pretense that the family can help the addict get sober. Mm -hmm. And that's why every day I get like, at least a quarter of my messages are moms that are like, how do I get my son sober? And I'm just telling them you can't until he wants to. So all a parent can do is, or a family member or a friend can do is just lead by example and work on, them, work on themselves and... Very much so focus on themselves and their recovery and start to study. And don't enable them, yeah. If, you, if a parent or a loved one of an addict really started to study addiction and talk to people who've been sober, I think it would be one of those things that, like these rehabs, in my opinion, a lot of them are salespeople and they're going to say anything under the moon to get the parent to drop off the kid. And that's who these parents are reaching out to. They're not talking to addicts that have been there. Yeah. And I think if they actually did, like if they read Bill Wilson's book, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, when they get past uh, the doctor's opinion and past Bill's story, they're going to sit back and say, you know, there's nothing we could do, period. Huh. A psychiatrist sat down with a patient of alcoholism and uh, basically said you need a miracle. It was in that book, uh, it was written in 1934, so this was before we had rehabs and stuff. And mm -hmm. he said, uh, alcoholics of your variety are pretty much screwed and you need a phenomenon, a phenomenon to happen. I've seen it happen very rarely with some people and it, it's kind of like a miracle. Mm -hmm. So I think reading that book and reading his story is one of those eye openers that a psychiatrist, imagine your prescription is a miracle. Yeah. Like that's what he says, <laughs> you know, you're just, and it's your will. Like yeah. you think that I could just stop and this doctor's saying no. He's like, you might be able to stop for two, three, five years, but 10 years from now. And once you start to drink or use drugs, the phenomenon of craving happens and the obsession and it doesn't stop until you're either in prison, dead, or you're just emotionally devastated to your core, like, you know, spiritual death. And you say you just woke up one day and you're like, oh, I'm going to stop doing meth. I was like, I'm going to stop doing all drugs. Meth yeah. was already out of the picture oh, right, for like yeah. two years. Okay. And uh, it's just, it's weird to me because everybody's looking for that bottom. Everybody's like, I'm going to hit bottom. You know, everything's going to fall apart. And some yeah. people are actually looking for that as a reason to quit. And I've seen a lot of bad things happen. I've had a lot of bad things happen. But at the end of the day, what my bottom was, was seeing the whole thing as a bottom and realizing I was altering the chemistry of my brain. It wasn't me. I was hurting my family. I was hurting myself. And... I've had loved ones who are alcoholics or addicts and it's, I love them to death and it really does hurt me, especially when someone goes out and relapse uh, because I'm not speaking to them, I'm speaking to the drugs, like they're gone already, they're not yeah. them. Be sure to check out Philip's information in the description. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.